For centuries, man has searched the Holy Scriptures, seeking a path to reconnect with the Creator. His very words revealed to humanity through his prophets shed the light of truth into a darkened world and have brought hope, comfort, and meaning to millions. Creation itself bears witness to the light of God's Word. In this video series, we explore the very thumbprint of God's workmanship and revelation of His truth shining forth from the heavens above. This is the Bible in the Stars. In the book of Psalms in the Bible, Psalm 19, verse 1, it reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Information is embedded in the skies above. It's been there since the creation of the world. Let's take a look and see now how this information was understood by the ancients and how the skies themselves declare the biblical narrative. I'm going to take you back to a very specific year and day in time. How this date was arrived at would take too long to explain for the purposes of this section of this video series, but suffice to say, it was determined through a careful and detailed study of Bible chronology. The Bible is actually fairly specific on the timeline of world history, more so than many realize. It lists times and ages for many of the key figures and events in biblical history, and because of this, it is very possible, with a bit of examination and determination, to come up with a specific time frame for the creation of the world. Many famous figures in history have attempted to piece together this biblical puzzle, and here is a list of a few of them. Bishop Usher came up with a famous date of 4004 BC, as the year of creation. In addition to that, Sir Isaac Newton, the discoverer of the principles of gravity and the famous physicist, came up with a year of 3988 BC. Johannes Kepler, the father of the planetary laws of motion, came up with a year of 3993 BC. Martin Luther, the famous theologian and father of the Protestant Reformation, came up with a year of 3961 BC. And an additional text from the Jewish tradition, known as the Seder Olam Rabbah, came up with a year of 3761 BC, which is a foundational text for the keeping of the Jewish Hebrew calendar, where they derived their current year and dates. As you notice from this list, and there are many others besides this, the approximate age of the Earth is somewhere around 6,000 years ago, according to the Bible. Now, of course, this differs greatly from the theory of evolution and the mindset of modern science that believes the Earth is millions of years old. It is not the purpose of this video series to debate that topic. That is debated greatly elsewhere on the Internet. Suffice to say, we do take a creationist worldview. But what I wish to show in this video series is that the stars themselves bear evidence of this. And so, we will go forward taking a look at the world from the creationary mindset, from the belief that the Earth is in fact 6,000 years old, and show how nature itself bears witness to this fact. In this video, I wish to offer an alternative year for creation, a year that I believe is backed both by my own studies of biblical chronology as well as the stars themselves when one studies astronomy for that date. The year that I believe creation occurred is the year 3967 BC. And when we look to the heavens for that date, we find some very interesting things indeed. So let's go back in time now to the year 3967 BC and see what the heavens reveal.
Before I begin, I want to give a word of caution and warning regarding the subject matter we will be covering in this video in the series. Because the stars are named after pagan deities and gods, we will be looking at the etymological and historical roots of those gods that the stars were named after. This is in no way, shape, or form an endorsement of those pagan beliefs. On the contrary, the Bible itself considers paganism idolatry and a sin against our Creator. But in order to do this subject matter justice, it is necessary to look at some of those historical facts. Therefore, please be aware that we will be covering a lot of that topic in this video. However, the truth found in the Bible stands in contradiction to those pagan beliefs. At best, paganism is a mere corruption of that truth long lost in their histories. The real truth is found in the Holy Scriptures and in the living Word of God. Please keep this in mind as we go forward. The year is 3967 BC. It is a Saturday evening, March 8th, 5.40 p.m. sunset Jerusalem time. Although Jerusalem does not yet exist, this is what the heavens and the skies would have looked like from that vantage point on the map. As we remove the atmosphere to allow the stars to be seen clearly, we can see that the planets Jupiter, Mars, and Venus are following the sun not far above the horizon in its descent into night. We will also remove the land so that you can clearly see the stars that have fallen below the horizon to get a better vantage point of the fullness of the night sky. Because this is sunset, it is a time of transition from one day to the next on the Hebrew calendar. Saturday evening is the switchover into Sunday. Therefore, this is the first day of the week, but not just the first day of the week only, the first day of the first week of the first year of creation. But of course, everything that you see here was not visible on the first day of creation. Firstly, because there were no human beings to gaze at the stars on the first day. Man was not created according to the Bible until the sixth day of creation. Likewise, the sun, the moon, and the stars were not created until the fourth day of creation, according to the Genesis account. Therefore, nothing that is shown here would have been actually visible on that day. But even though the stars themselves would not have been visible on day one of creation, we can calculate, through the use of modern astronomy software, the positions and locations that they would have been at on day one. I'm going to bring in now the constellations, or rather the artistic renditions of those constellations to help give us a better sense of where we are in the night sky. The green line represents the horizon. The red letters that you see, of course, represent the cardinal locations, the directions, south, west, northwest, and so forth. As we discussed in the first video of this series, spring in ancient times began when the sun was in the constellation Aries, and specifically, the first day of the first month of the year began when the moon passed the sun and the first sliver of the new moon became visible to the naked eye. Let us now examine the players as they take the stage in the grand cosmic story in the sky. Our first player is the planet Jupiter, seen here. Jupiter was the supreme deity of the ancient Romans in their pagan religion. The name Jupiter corresponds to the two words Deu and Peter. Deus means day or sky, whereas Pater means father. So therefore, Jupiter was the father in the sky, or the heavenly father. His identifying implement is the thunderbolt and is equivalent to the Greek god Zeus. In the Germanic tradition, he was equivalent to the god Thor, the god of thunder, from whence we get the name Thursday or Thor's day. In the Bible, one of the three sons of Noah was Japheth. The word Japheth in Hebrew, or Yapheth, 
means to open or to enlarge. Japheth was known for spreading out over a large territory and being the progenitor of a large people group. Specifically, Japheth was the father of the Europeans. It may be possible, although not etymologically proven, that the term Japheth, as the ancestor of the Europeans, over time was corrupted into the term Jupiter, or Heavenly Father. Ancient cultures often would deify their ancestors as a form of ancestor worship. Japheth as the father of the Europeans might have undergone such revision. In Hebrew, the name of the planet Jupiter is Tzedek, which means righteousness or justice, in the sense of judging, such as just kings or rulers who would make righteous judgments. Therefore, we can see that Jupiter would correspond to the term Sky Father, or a representation of our Father in Heaven. Of course, that is not to say that Jupiter is the Father in Heaven, that would be pagan idolatry. But rather, in our pageant in the sky, Jupiter will instead play the character of the Father in Heaven, representing him in our heavenly story, just as an actor would represent a character on the stage. So let's make a list of all of our characters. The first being Jupiter, representing God the Father in Heaven as a righteous judge. Our next actor will be the planet Mars. Mars is known as the red planet because the color of its soil gives off a reddish hue that can be seen in the night sky. Mars corresponds to the ancient Roman pagan god of war. The etymology for the name Mars is uncertain. It's believed to be related to the word Mawart, which is an ancient Italic god of war. It may be Etruscan in origin, but we're not certain as to where the word Mars actually comes from. It's of foreign derivation to the Latin language. Mars has many equivalent counterparts in many other cultures. For example, in the Babylonian tradition, he was Nurgal, the deity of fire, war, and destruction. In the Hindu tradition, he was Engaraka, in Sanskrit, after the celibate god of war who possessed signs of Ares and Scorpio. In ancient China, the advent of Mars was taken as a portent of bane, grief, war, and murder. And of course in Greece, he corresponded to their god of war. The word for the Greek god of war, Ares, should not be confused with the constellation of Ares, which is spelled differently. The Greeks also had another name for the planet Mars, Pyros, meaning fiery, derived from its reddish color. In the Hebrew tradition, the name for Mars is Ma'adim, which means the one who blushes, or the red one. In Roman mythology, Mars was not only the god of war, he was also an agricultural guardian. Guarding the agricultural lands of the nation may have been the primary reason for going to war. Mars is, of course, the red planet. Red fire, red blood, and red earth are all things that are associated with war. It's no wonder that the ancients would have looked up at the night sky, seeing the red planet, and made that association with their pagan gods. The Hebrew word for the planet Mars, Ma'adim, comes from the word red. There are many related words in Hebrew that relate to the color of red and the word Adam. Dam, for example, is the Hebrew word for blood. Adam is the Hebrew word for red. Adam is the Hebrew word for man, but is also derived from the word red. Adama is the name of the ground from which Adam was taken. It gets its word from the reddish color of the soil. It's possible that the soil that Adam was taken from was red-colored clay, or something of that nature. It says in Genesis 2-7 that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. The word man here is Adam, and the word ground is Adama both related to the color red. 
Therefore, we can see that Mars, as the red planet, is associated with the color for Earth in the Bible. It will serve as the representation of Earth in our night sky pageantry. So let's add number two to the list. Mars will represent Earth in the story above. Now let's move on to the next planet, Venus. Venus in ancient times was known as the Queen of Heaven. In the Roman mythology, she was known as the goddess of love and beauty. Her Greek counterpart was the goddess Aphrodite. In the Greek mythology, Aphrodite was born from the foam of the sea. She in turn was derived from many other ancient fertility goddesses of the Near East, such as Astarte or Ishtar or the Sumerian cult of Inanna and many others. As mentioned, many of these ancient goddesses relating to the dawn or to Venus or spring were referred to as the Queen of Heaven, such as Inanna, Anat, Isis, Nut, Astarte, Asherah, Ashtaroth, and others. Many of these appear in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 7, for example, there's a reference to the Queen of Heaven, where it says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. The word heaven in that verse is shamayim in the Hebrew. It refers to the heaven, heavens, or sky. It is the same word that is used in the first chapter of Genesis when it discusses the creation of the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1.8 we read that God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Heaven in this verse is referring to the creation of the sky. The Hebrew name for the planet Venus is called Kochavet. It's the feminine form of the word Kochav, which is the name for the male planet Mercury. So Kochavet is the female planet and Mercury is the male planet, Kochav. Another name for Venus is Kochavet Noga, or sometimes Noga, which simply means the bright one or the bright planet. Its brightness comes from its thick clouds and its proximity to the sun, which reflect the light to Earth, making it the brightest object in the sky after the moon during night. In our early example, we related Mars to the Earth through the reddish color of its soil. Here, we're relating Venus to the sky through its cloudy atmosphere. Therefore, Venus, with its ancient title of the Queen of Heaven, will be a representation of the sky in our celestial story above. So let's add Venus to our list. Venus will represent the heavens or the sky. Now let's move on to our next actor in the heavenly story, the sun. In ancient times, there were many pagan gods that represented the sun. For the Romans, one of them was Sol. Sol was equivalent to the Greek god of the sun, Helios. Helios was known as the guardian of oaths and the god of sight as well as a sun god. It was also related to another sun god, Apollo. Apollo was known as the god of oracles, sunlight, and knowledge. In the ancient Indian tradition, their sun god was Saraya. Helios, Sol, and Saraya, in turn, were equivalent to the Mesopotamian sun god, Utu or Shamash. Shamash, in addition to being a sun god, was also a god of justice, morality, and truth according to those ancient pagan cultures. The Hebrew word for the sun is Shemesh, related to the word Shamash. It comes from an unused root word meaning brilliant or to be bright. Therefore, the sun, being the bright or brilliant object of the day sky, will represent light, of course, in our story. So now let's add the sun to our list. The sun will represent light. Moving on now from the sun, let's move on to the next planet in our series of actors in the sky. Our next planet is Mercury. Mercury, in the Roman pagan tradition, was the god of commerce, eloquence, messages, communication, and the etymology of its name 
is where we get the words merchant and commerce. Mercury was also known as the keeper of boundaries, referring to a role as a bridge between the upper and lower worlds in pagan thinking. The Greek equivalent to Mercury was Hermes, who was the herald of the gods, or God's messenger. In the Akkadian tradition, the equivalent to Mercury was Nabu, or Navu. He was the god of literacy, rational arts, scribes, and wisdom. The Hebrew word for prophet, Navi, is related to the word Nabu, which means to announce or to prophesize, again signifying the role as a messenger for God. During the Hellenistic times, Nabu was sometimes identified with Apollo because Apollo was a giver of prophecies, but more often than not, he was associated with the divine messenger, the planet Mercury, which in the Greek tradition was Hermes. A reference to Mercury can be found in the Bible in the book of Acts. We read here, starting in Acts 14, verse 11, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. So in this passage, we can see that they were equating the Christian Apostle Paul and his associate Barnabas as Jupiter and Mercury. They saw Barnabas as the king of the gods, Jupiter, and Paul as his spokesperson because Paul was doing all the talking. Therefore, they equated Paul with Mercury, the messenger of the gods. The English word prophet comes from two Proto-Indo-European words, her and ba. Her means forward, or in front of or before, and ba is from the root fani, which means to speak. But there are two definitions to the word ba in the Proto-Indo-European. The second one is to speak, tell, or say, but the first one means to shine, which can refer to visible light or in the sense of enlightening someone. As we mentioned earlier, the planet Mercury in Hebrew is kokav which simply means the planet in masculine form. The feminine version, again, was Kochavet, which refers to Venus. Mercury and Venus may be given the identities of male and female due to their relationship to the Sun. Mercury and Venus are inner planets in relation to Earth, and therefore, from our view in the night sky, they are never more than one or two astrological signs away from the Sun at any given point in time. They appear paired together coupled as male and female. Therefore, in our storyline, Mercury will represent a male prophet, a representation of a man, but also as a messenger. So let's add Mercury now to our list. Mercury will represent man or God's messenger, a prophet. Moving on now from Mercury, let's look at our next character in the sky. We'll take a step back out now a bit in our astronomical picture to get a wider vantage point of the sky on the first day of creation. Here are the actors we've covered so far. Jupiter, Mars, Venus, the Sun, and Mercury. And here is our next actor, the Moon. In the ancient Akkadian tradition, the name for the Moon Goddess was Sin. To the Sumerians, her name was Nanar although there are many lunar deities in the ancient world. The moon, of course, was seen by many cultures as a goddess of darkness or the night. One concept of darkness in the ancient cultural traditions was the concept of Abzu. Abzu was an Akkadian term for the primeval sea that they saw as the void space of the underworld. The Greek word abyssos is related to Abzu. In the Bible, it is referred to as the abyss, also known as the deep. The Hebrew word tohum, representing the abyss or the primordial waters of chaos, are the source from which the world was created out of in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. But it could also refer to the depths of the sea, or the spring water coming out from the interior of the earth. Genesis 1, verse 2 reads, And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
the deep, the void, and the waters of the abyss were associated with darkness. In the next verses we read how God creates light and separates the light from the darkness. The light, in turn, he calls day in verse 5, and the darkness he calls night. Starting in verse 16, we read about the creation of the sun and the moon, how God made two great lights to rule the day and the night. The lesser light, the moon, was made to rule over the darkness. Many ancient pagan cultures associated lunar goddesses not only with night, but also with darkness and the underworld. In the Roman tradition, the goddess of the moon was Luna, from where we get the name Lunar. She was considered to be a triple goddess. In her tripart form, she was considered to be Luna, Diana, and Hecate. Or as one historian put it, they were all Diana. Diana as Huntress, Diana as the moon, and Diana of the underworld. Her Greek counterpart was also a goddess of the hunt and the wilderness, as well as wild animals and chastity. Perhaps the association with being the goddess of the hunt relates to the bow shape of the moon during its crescent phase, and the concept of hunters wandering through the countryside in search of wild animals as prey, just as the moon would wander through the night sky like a bow in the stars. In Hebrew, there may be a few terms that are etymologically related to the word for moon. The Hebrew word arach means to wander. The Hebrew word for moon, yirach, may possibly be related to that term. Another word in Hebrew that may sound a bit similar is the word yirah, which means to shoot or to throw in a sense of shooting an arrow as an archer. The English word moon comes from the Proto-Indo-European root word mi, which means to measure. It relates to the moon's phases through the night sky as a measurement of time. So then, what we can see in our character of the moon is it can take on a different role depending on how it appears or its phase in the night sky. As a ruler of the night, it will represent a measurement of time and the separation of light and darkness. And in the case of its dark form, it can also represent the sea or the dark waters of the abyss. Therefore, let's add the moon now to our list. The moon will mean to measure, or in some forms, darkness or dark waters of the sea. Let us move on now to the last planet in our collection of characters. The planet Saturn. Saturn, in the ancient Roman religion, was the god of agriculture, periodic renewal, and liberation, among other things. He is equivalent to the Greek titan Cronus. Cronus was usually depicted with a harp, scythe, or sickle, and he was considered the patron of the harvest. A famous festival was held each year called Saturnalia in the Roman tradition, which celebrated the time around the winter solstice, when the days would stop getting shorter and would begin to get longer again. It was seen as a separation, a time of periodic renewal from one year to the next. Saturnalia was a time that would symbolize the freeing of souls and the commencement of a golden age. Some of the customs and traditions of Saturnalia over time were conflated in Europe with Christmas, which also takes place around the time of the winter solstice. The Titan, Cronus, was sometimes associated with Kronos, the Greek deity of time, although these are two separate figures. Cronus represented the destructive ravages of time. And because of this, during the time of the Renaissance, Father Time was often depicted as wielding a harvesting scythe, similar to Cronus. The word Kronos is where we get our modern words chronology, chronometer, and chronicle, things associated with time. In the Hindu tradition, the name for Saturn was Shani, and he was seen as a black figure carrying a sword and sitting on a vulture. Shani would judge everyone based on the good or bad deeds that they performed in their life, as a sort of grim reaper and judge rolled into one. In the Hindu calendar, Shani is also the basis for their seventh day of the week, which corresponds to Saturday on our calendar. Saturday, of course, is named for Saturn. 
And in the Hebrew tradition, the name for the seventh day of the week is Shabbat, which is where we get the word Sabbath, meaning the day of rest. The name for the planet Saturn in Hebrew is Shabbatai. Shabbat in Hebrew means to cease, desist, or rest. As a planet, Saturn is the slowest moving of the visible planets through the sky. It takes about 29 and a half years for it to move through the entire zodiac and the etymology of its name may come from an Etruscan word named Seder, which means slow. The Hebrew word Shabbat is also related to the Hebrew word for seven, which is Shabbat. It states in Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 that thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. In verse 3 it says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. That word sanctified in Hebrew is kadash, and it means to be set apart or be consecrated. When we look at the night sky for our day of creation, we notice an interesting feature. Our six prior characters which move visibly through the night sky, are on one side of the horizon in the west. Saturn is set apart, separate from the others, on the east. And it resides in the constellation of Libra, a constellation depicted as scales, a sign of judgment. Here we can see the ecliptic, the line on which the heavenly bodies move through the night sky. And we can see that unlike our other characters, which are in the portion of the sky associated with the months of spring, Saturn is in the months associated with the fall or harvest time. Therefore, Saturn, as the planet of harvest and rest, will represent completed time of resting and judgment. Let us add Saturn to our list now. Saturn will represent the Sabbath, the completion, also associated with the number seven. It also has connections with time and the final judgment. And it is appropriate that Saturn is the last of our items on our list, for our list is now complete. And now we can begin to look at how the characters take the stage and perform the story in the stars found in the Bible. <laughs>